Take football. It's more than a sport. It's a part of American culture and a passion for millions of fans. Part of its appeal is that it's a serious contact sport. But over the past decade, there's been a spate of stories about veteran football players succumbing to depression and dementia, and several top players have committed suicide. Autopsies of their brains revealed that an abnormal protein had destroyed cells in areas that regulate impulse control, judgment, and memory. The condition appeared to be caused by a history of multiple concussions. A concussion occurs when a violent blow to the head or sudden acceleration, like whiplash, forcefully jars or shakes the brain. Symptoms can include an inability to think clearly, blurry vision, and dizziness. But scientists still don't understand exactly what happens to the brain in a concussion. Four years ago, neuroimaging specialist Tom Talavage and his colleagues at the Purdue Neurotrauma Group began tracking football players at local high schools, because professional players are not the only ones whose brains take a beating. I had two concussions, one in eighth grade and one in sophomore year. I just felt real dizzy. I felt sick to my stomach. I didn't think anything of it, and I went back in and played. The research team wired the players' helmets. This is our sensor package, and it fits in between the padding and this space here. These accelerometers record the intensity and location of each hit, as well as the motion of the player's head. A wireless connection sends information to the researchers in real time. I wonder if this is contact with the forehead and then sliding and hitting the shoulder pads. Later, the data is translated into a plot. You can imagine unzipping the helmet in the back and pulling it open and flattening it out. Blue dots represent small hits. Yellow and red dots represent big hits. Before the season began, the researchers compiled a baseline cognitive score for each player, measuring things like attention span, reaction time, and problem solving. And a functional MRI scan measured brain activity while the player performed another set of tests. The plan was to run the same battery of tests each time a player sustained a concussion. Unsteady, dizzy, feel sick to your stomach. After two weeks of practice and two weeks of games, the players had sustained plenty of hits. But no one suffered a concussion. Today at all, everything looks good. So the researchers retested several players anyway, expecting little to no change from their baselines. The results stunned them. This was a player who was never diagnosed with any sort of concussion. There's no reason that an athletic trainer or a coach or any other player would have ever recommended he be examined. Yet his MRI showed his brain working much harder on the same tests he'd aced four weeks earlier. He also showed cognitive deficits, especially in his visual memory. No concussion, but he had sustained several hundred hits to the head. This looks like a player who's getting their head down, charging into the line, and takes a hit every single play. Those hits produced the kind of impairment the research team had assumed would be caused only by concussions. And this was just one player of several with the same impairment. Twelve weeks after the season ended, the players were tested again. Their scores returned to normal, but the surprising earlier results forced the scientists to rethink assumptions about head injuries. What we're only starting now to understand is that the players who are getting hit a lot are actually ending up just as, if not more, impaired as the players who get concussions. Some three million kids under the age of 18 play football in the United States. Could repeated blows to the head, even ones that don't qualify as concussions, affect their academic performance? And just how great is the risk of permanent damage for these kids and kids playing other contact sports? These are young kids. Their brains are still developing. If we are causing some low level of damage, the body is going to be spending time repairing those injuries. So as these kids are playing more and more football, are we going to find that their brains are becoming less and less normal? Tom and his colleagues hope their research will answer that question. In the meantime, what can we do to make young athletes safer? If we can't get them to give up football for basket weaving, can we at least build a better helmet? Traditionally, football helmets have been designed to prevent skull fractures, and they do that remarkably well. But how can we protect the brain inside the skull during head-on collisions and other blows. Every hit 
whether it's from the side or the front or the top, it's also gonna cause the head to rotate either back and forth or side to side, or even in this twisting motion or some combination of those. These rotational forces can be just as devastating as the direct hit. So Eric Nauman is developing a next generation helmet based on a double shell design. Separated by a layer of foam, the two shells move independently. In an impact, the outer shell should absorb some of the rotational force before it reaches the brain. It will take years of testing to reveal whether this new helmet can actually protect young brains during routine play. The message about head injuries and brain damage is also reaching the playing field. Some coaches have begun to emphasize proper tackling techniques, where players lead with the shoulders and get their heads out of the way. We certainly see that players who take fewer hits to the head or fewer large hits to the head tend to show fewer changes in their neurocognitive testing, in their neuroimaging. With better monitoring, better equipment, and better technique, we're here to make the game safer. When it comes to safety, most of us think children first and foremost. They're our future. Who could blame us for trying to protect them from every peril? Young man, do you have a permit? Can I see that seatbelt, sir? If we could, we'd probably dress them in bubble wrap and childproof the entire world. But I wonder, is there such a thing as too safe? That's a dangerous piece of equipment. Don't we all need to test our physical limits? Isn't that how we gain the confidence we need to explore, to invent and create the innovations that improve our world? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. This is this! And dangerous! Maybe the key to living well is finding the sweet spot between an acceptable level of risk, making stuff safer!